Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to Thursday's Fantasy NBA Today. I am Dan Bespris, and this is, of course, our last regular midweek show before we transition tomorrow into our week in review episode of the podcast. Hope you guys have been enjoying the show so far this week. A visit from Jonas Nader on Tuesday. Give us a little stash deadline preview. The stash master followed by the rant master, Josh Millman, yesterday. Uh, My own schedule is precluding us from having the great Adam King on the show today. Shout out to Adam. We'll get him on probably as soon as next week. Although I may have some childcare related issues to work out on my own front there, but we'll get this piece together. And frankly, I get to talk to all these guys. One week from today, February the 10th at 8 a.m. Pacific time, when our Sports Ethos Trade Deadline Live show kicks off. First thing in the morning here on the West Coast. It's a five-hour show without commercial breaks, live on YouTube. we got the link in the description of this podcast. I hope you guys will visit it, click the thumbs up button, set an alarm, subscribe, whatever it is that you got to do over at our YouTube page And come along for the ride with us on that. It's going to be a damn wingding. Please do come check out our live show. We have so much fun. We've got all these experts coming on the show. We've got uh, front office experts. We've got fantasy experts. We've got team-specific experts. It's going to be the best. I am Dan Bespris. Hello again, everybody. At Dan Bespris on Twitter. D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. Let's just dive straight into the Wednesday recap. Washington, big win on the road at Philadelphia. Daniel Gafford back into the starting five. Gave the team a little bit of a jolt. Didn't foul out trying to guard Joel Embiid, who's just been devouring people so far this year, particularly lately. And Gafford did a pretty good job. He held his own. He had four fouls. He had some foul trouble in the first half, but he played 21 minutes with no Thomas Bryant around. And this is why on yesterday's podcast, we talked about picking him up. Because suddenly he's got his starting job back. And the Wizards are better when he's their center. Montrezl Harrell, the energy guy. Gafford, the rebounder. The dunker. Field goal percent, although Montrez can hold his own in that regard. Kyle Kuzma had another good ball game. He's been doing actually quite a lot uh, with Bradley Beal out. And has actually been a much larger winner then KCP, who was awful in this game. 29 minutes. Oh, I said that like a Brooklynite. Four points, four rebounds. I thought for sure he'd be more than good enough to stream with Beal on the shelf, and he hasn't been very good lately. He may pick it up. We might see Beal sooner than later. It's hard to know. You just hate that you know the missing two games becomes evaluated, missing four games, and so on and so forth. But that's your Wizards report. That's why we wanted you guys to go pick up Gafford as especially after the five-minute game opened up a little bit of a window to listen to yesterday's podcast and then still have time to make the move on him. Because it was telegraphed. I mean, the Wizards went right back to what they were before Bryant came back, and that was Gafford as the starting center posting top 80 value. He can easily hit top 80 in 21 minutes a game. You know, he's one block away from basically the line that we all wanted him to have on draft night. Nothing of note on the Sixers' side. Maxi, Embiid, Harris, that's pretty much it with Seth Curry out. When Curry's out, Danny Green, Matisse Thibel tend to have enough time on the floor to be useful, but I still can't really bring myself to trust them. George Niang was okay off the bench. Furkan Korkmaz is also out right now. I don't know. I just I, I feel completely uncomfortable going beyond the the main guys in Philly. You just, yeah, you might find yourself on the right end of a thigh bowl, a thigh bowl two steal, three block game, or you might end up with this one. I'd rather leave it alone. Orlando, winners on the road at the Zombie Pacers. Karis Levert, Justin Holiday, the only scheduled starters. Isaiah Jackson, who was a very popular streaming choice for good reason, played 22 seconds of this game and badly turned his ankle and did not return. The Pacers ended up going to a very, very small lineup, which is wild because this is a team that had five guys that could play center, and they're all hurt right now. Sabonis, Turner, Brissett, Goga, and now Jackson. That's wild. Anywho, as long as all of those guys are out, 
Would I trust Terry Taylor to go get 16 rebounds again? I can't. Why can't I? Because I don't know who the hell that is. He could play eight minutes in the next ball game. I just have no idea. Karis LeVert, yes. Justin Holiday, I think you could start in this spot. Chris Duarte, you can start in this spot. And then Torrey Craig finally had a better ball game, but he sort of lost my confidence. You should be pretty confident in LeVert. He's going to have all the usage on planet Earth. I think Justin Holiday, you know, it's not going to be an exciting game by any stretch, but I think you should have enough confidence in him throwing him in there. He'll get you some three-pointers. He'll almost definitely get you some kind of defensive stat. I don't... Seems like it could be either a steal or a block these days. And his percentages have not been horrible. Not completely ruining you from the field. So I'm okay with that. I know that we had sort of abandoned ship on Pacers streams for a little bit, but I think you can unabandon the ship now put the put the uh the sailors back on the boat whatever that metaphor might be boston got another nice victory they've been playing well lately it's a game they should win to be fair they outshot charlotte 51 to 43 percent it's not entirely clear how charlotte kept this game as close as they did but they did they got more shots, they got more free throws, so the possessions tipped that direction, but it's not like the turnover battle was all that lopsided, and the rebound battle wasn't that lopsided either. I don't know. By all metrics, the Celtics should have been winning this game by, like, 15, and they were up for they were up 10 for a while, but Charlotte's not going away. LaMelo Ball has come on strong lately. Kelly Oubre is startable when he's warm. He didn't shoot the ball all that well in this one, but he's, he's good enough to go these days, especially with Gordon Hayward working his way back right now. P.J. Washington got a rare start. Cody Martin shifted to the bench. And I'll tell you, if P.J. starts, and I, I, I've got to believe that he goes back to the bench when Gordon Hayward comes back, because Hayward makes his team a hell of a lot better. But starter P.J. Washington playing starters minutes, that is a must-start fantasy player. I just, we might be looking at one game of this. So is that worth it? I don't know. I truly don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it's worth... He's probably rostered. He's over-rostered because of how inconsistent, and he has these big games every once in a while. Mason Plumlee missed a little bit of time. He had 17 rebounds himself, by the way, in this one. So Charlotte's a little bit weird right now. I think Oubre's mostly rostered, so you're probably not going to be able to pick him up. P.J. Washington's mostly rostered, and it's possible that this was his only serviceable fantasy game if Hayward does come back. But at the same time... In Roto, in particular, if you can squeeze one big one out of PJ, you should probably do it. Worth a flyer if he's floating around out there. On the Boston side, uh, Josh Richardson had a weird explosion game. I don't think you can expect that'll happen again. Al Horford, 12 rebounds, couple of three-pointers. He's actually played a little bit better the last one or two games. And that's something. I mean, we're not, you know, hang our hat on it or anything. It's just been a little bit better than awful. And that's something. I have become an unapologetic Robert Williams mega fan here on the podcast, and it continues in this one. Five for six shooting, ten points, eight boards, three assists, two steals, three blocks. Just another positively brilliant fantasy line while only scoring ten points. That's how you have to do it. He's going to be underrated by the community at large because he doesn't score 15 points a game. But everything else he does is just so incredible. He's passing. He's getting three assists a game these days. The steals, the blocks, the field goal percent. Even the free throw percent has been pretty good lately. He's a monster. He's a bona fide monster. And just enjoy it or see if you can go get him for someone in like the, I don't know, 35 range? Probably not. At, maybe. I don't know. Still a lot of people that don't listen to this podcast that are not actively hunting Robert Williams. I think what I would do as sort of a corollary here what i would do on the robert williams front is don't try to lowball the other whoever whatever manager in your league has him on their team don't screw around with it because you lowball them and they say no and then you come back with a better offer they're going to get the idea that you're coming for him oh this person is trying to get the time lord off me by the way uh robert williams on the season now is number 23 by totals and number 24 by averages So he's right there. 
he's like he's a bona fide second rounder on the season, and he's a first rounder over the last we talked about it like six weeks now. So does he continue as a mid first from now until the end of the season? Probably not. But is he almost definitely a second rounder? For an entire year? I think the answer is yes at this point. I don't think he falls outside the top 25. I just don't. At Walgreens, we know February is the season for L-O-V-E. It's also something sweet for your sweetheart season. Or my favorite, wait, that's today's season? Or the just found out my kid has a crush season. Good luck, Mom. This Valentine's Day, Walgreens makes it easy to quickly get last-minute gifts with pickup in as little as 30 minutes. Because if it's Cupid season, it's Walgreens season. Right now, premium chocolate bags and boxes are two for $8. Offer valid through 214 while supplies last. Restrictions supply. See Walgreens.com for details. He could go, I feel like he'd almost go up before he'd go down from number 24. I could very well see Time Lord finishing at like number 18 on the season. So don't lowball. Don't come in there with like a top 55 guy and then get upset when it gets turned down and then come back with a top 45 guy because then they're going to know you're going to keep climbing that ladder. You got to come in and throw your big punch early. You got to come in with John Collins at 34. You got to come in with smoking lava hot Gary Trent at 33, who's hit like seven three pointers a game the last couple of weeks. That probably won't be enough to get it done. You got to come in with Drew Holiday. You got to come in with Jonas Valanciunas or Jared Allen. You could even come in with Zach Levine, who's, I would, I don't want to, it's a weird term to use, but he's violently overrated in fantasy because he's a high percentages, high points guy who somehow hasn't been all that effective in the, all, all of the least noticeable categories. Like, he hasn't rebounded all that great, his steals and blocks are low, and turnovers are kind of high. Not to take anything away from Levine, he's been awesome again this year, but he's not going much higher than top 30, which is kind of what I argued during draft season when everybody was yelling at me that he needed to go super-duper early this year, is that there's just too many bodies around him, and he doesn't do enough defensively these are guys that miles bridges these are guys i would give up for the time lord yes it changes the makeup of your team uh, a pretty good amount so you know maybe we're a little late in the season to overhaul the way your roster looks like that but damn if you wouldn't be getting the player with the higher overall ranking yeah, it's tough. I know. I know. We went off on this long, circuitous route to Robert Williams-related joy. And at the same time, how could you trade away the guy who's scoring 25 points with three threes and go pick up a guy who's scoring 10 points with none, who's getting you four-plus defensive stats a game from a guy who's getting you less than one? It totally changes the way your team is built. So I get it. You can't just trade anybody away. I'm just saying, I think Time Lord is a second rounder the rest of the way. Maybe better. Memphis beat New York on the road. Grizzlies just coming in waves like they always do. Zaire Williams had a really big ball game. He's been seeing a lot of playing time lately, and he frankly kind of earned it in this one. De'Anthony Melton was red hot and then still only got 18 minutes. Brandon Clark, I thought, played relatively well too, and he also only got 18 minutes. It's a mix and match. It's a mix and match. Clark was a plus seven. Melton was a plus 8, but then also the main guys. Ja was a plus 13. John Conchar and Tyus Jones were the only guys on Memphis that had a negative uh, plus-minus rating in the ballgame. Slomo only played 14 and a half minutes, so it wasn't like his situation was the one that dictated. It was they wanted more Steven Adams defensively. They wanted more Zaire Williams in this one. Whatever. I'm still sitting on Melton until the trade deadline. I'm sitting on Brandon Clark pretty much forever because... Again, he only needs 21 minutes to be a top 90 guy, and this is not that far from that. On the New York side, Mitchell Robinson, eight blocks in this ball game. Of course, I had him on my bench because he's been so horrible from the free throw line lately. Oops. Evan Fournier's on a little bit of a heater right now. You, If you want to roll the dice, have at it, man. He's had a really good three-point stroke over the last month or so. Uh, will he get enough shots on a night-to-night basis? That's always a problem. 
And then Nerlens Noel, two rebounds, an assist, and a steal in 16 minutes. I think we can go ahead and move on from that one as well. It just seems like it's not going to be there, especially on a game where Mitchell Robinson is having a huge one. He's still the starter. He's going to get that bonus run, but the Knicks lost anyway. Houston beat Cleveland. I mean, injuries are really starting to take their toll on a lot of teams in the NBA these days. Cleveland is down so many bodies. No Darius Garland, and that was kind of too much for the Cavs. Kevin Love tried to do it. 21 points, 13 rebounds, but and Evan Mobley, 29 and 12, but they just sort of couldn't do it alone. Jared Allen needs the point guard to get him open, so he's not going to be effective when there's not a point guard around. And point, J.D. Osmond is, you know, worked okay against whoever the stinker team they was. Uh, the, the Pacers, that who they played yesterday? I already forgot two days ago. Uh, Houston's also kind of a stinker team, but, it, you know, the Rockets just too much firepower. I think Osman is actually, in general, he missed all three of his free throws, or this wouldn't have been that horrible of a ball game. The lack of assists is upsetting for a guy who was supposed to be doing some of the ball handling. Brandon Goodwin got most of the assists in this one. Uh, I'll hold on. I'll hold Osman until Garland comes back. He's not a massive upside stream, but he is a worthwhile stream nonetheless. Goodwin, I'm not too worried about. There's no pedigree there where you think this is going to happen every single night. And uh, we see nobody else has really stepped up. Meanwhile, over on the Houston side, there were some brief stretches where Alperen Sengun and Christian Wood played side by side. That was interesting. Sengun up to 24 and a half minutes. That would be enough probably to get him into that top 100 neighborhood. Does have some issues with turnovers and percentages. Those are not easy to overcome. But as he starts this in the corner, and everybody's stashing him going into the trade deadline, and we've done plenty of shows on why people stashed him in October and why that was ridiculously early to do so. Uh, but now, you know, eight days out, seven days out, whatever the hell, what is today? It's day Thursday. Uh, seven days out, yeah, obviously. Sit on If you came this far, you're going to keep doing it. If you didn't, you can maybe he's still floating around out there. Uh, Jalen Green, we've talked about him many times. He's just going to slowly get better. You make your move when you feel like you want to make your move. People are going to pick him up after this one, but I'm sure the next one's going to be a quieter ball game anyway. Kevin Porter's been better lately, but he missed a bunch of free throws here. It's why I'm almost, I, I still can't really get behind it, even when things are going well. He's still in that 90 to 140 range because of percentages and lack of defensive stats. And so not a whole lot changed for me on the Houston side. You know, when we talked to Jonas... K.J. Martin, by the way, had uh, 10 points to steal a couple rebounds in 18 minutes. We talked to Jonas on Tuesday's show. Uh, we also mentioned Garrison Matthews as the other guy that could leap into a really interesting valuation if Eric Gordon gets moved. Gordon played 30 minutes in this game, and you better believe that 6 to 10 of those go to Garrison Matthews. He goes from 24 minutes a game to closer to 30 or even higher. Remember when Kevin Porter was out, he had value. When Gordon goes out, he has value. He might even be one step closer to value than K.J. Martin, even if his stat set isn't as fun. I know he had two steals and a block in this one. That's not really the M.O. for Matthews. He's going to hit three-pointers, get some rebounds, pretty good foul shooter, all that stuff. He might be the most likely rocket to move from one side of the cut line to the other, believe it or not, because he's actually kind of close to it as it is, so he doesn't need that big of a bump to leapfrog the ad barrier. Dallas had themselves an oopsies night, lost at home in overtime to the Gilgis Alexanderless Oklahoma City Thunder. Lou Dort, monster game. Josh Giddy, big ball game. Trey Mann had a really big game. Shot the ball well. Didn't do much besides shoot. He'll go get picked up in a bunch of spots, and then he'll get dropped when people are like, oh, crap. If he has a cold night, it's going to be eight points, one assist, and bad percentages. Oh, no. But still, fun one in this one if you happen to catch lightning in a bottle. Darius Baisley. Um, you know, you like the four defensive stats. You don't like the uh, four for 12 shooting and three for six foul line, three turnovers. This is what, okay, I mean, Darius Baisley sidetrack thing here. I personally thought Ty Jerome might get a little bit more opportunity with Shea out, and he's played relatively well in limited minutes, but it's not enough. So you can shuttle along from there. On the Dallas side, Kristaps still out, so Maxi Kleba stream still going strong. Nine cash counters, three steals, four blocks, two three-pointers. Brunson put up a big line. Luka put up a big line. Uh, Reggie Bullock stepping into Tim Hardaway Jr.'s minutes. When we talked about him a couple days ago as someone that actually could make a tiny bit of noise, I think even with this game, he's not getting added almost anywhere. So you can take as much time as you want 
to figure out if you should be rostering Reggie Bullock. And damn it, we probably are going to take as much time as we want to figure out if we should be rostering Reggie Bullock. But here's the thing. Over his last four ball games now, Reggie's hit 18 three-pointers. He's made every free throw he's taken over that stretch. He has seven steals in those four games. And, not that it doesn't not that it matters a whole lot, he has 21 rebounds in those games. And in his last two, forget this one because it was overtime, we'll just subtract five minutes. He played 38 minutes in overtime, so let's just call it 33. His last two ball games, the ones fully without Tim Hardaway, 31 and 33 minutes with six steals and eight three-pointers. Believe it or not, there's something there. My concern would be, what does he do when Kristaps comes back? Is there, how many shots does that pull away from Bullock? He took 16 in this game. I can't imagine that happens when when Porzingis is around. But it's looking more and more like maybe he's the guy that sticks as the one extra player on this team. Because Dorian Finney-Smith was the starting small forward. Could Reggie Bullock stick? He really could. He could be that next 3 and D guy. Low upside, lower upside, but there may be something there. And speaking of something there, got another testimonial from one of you guys on Twitter last night talking about how they were like a couple points, a couple Anthony Simons buckets away from winning $1,000 on Thrive Fantasy. I don't think Simons actually got the extra bucket, so apologies to the folk, the, uh, the dude that sent over the testimonial. But the rest of you guys really need to get in a mix on this thrivefantasy.com is the website they also have an app for all mobile devices the thrive fantasy app prop up it's prop bets it's prop bets you're picking overs and unders on the key guys on the card the dudes that do the most every night in the nba you're not dumpster diving you're not trying to figure out how to save a hundred dollars on one guy so you can spend a hundred dollars on another guy hate all that stuff drives me crazy i'm not I mean, here's the thing. I'm just not going to get into DFS. I mean, I've accepted that at this point. But this isn't really DFS. It's daily fantasy, but it's not really DFS. It's different. It's prop bets. And with our promo code, ETHOS, E-T-H-O-S, not only can you get the 100% deposit match bonus that I think everybody can get with their special promo codes, but with our promo code, ETHOS, you can get the two... $20 contest entry vouchers. And this is on a deposit of only 10 bucks. So put in $10 with promo code ethos at thrivefantasy.com, get an extra $10 and get two $20 contest entry vouchers. It's $60 of play for just a $10 deposit. I know you guys have $10 floating around that you were just going to screw off with or get, you know, two cups of coffee that you could have made at home, two mugs of tea that you could have made at home, or one Subway sandwich that you wouldn't want to make it home because it's not really very good. You can save $10 a thousand different places and throw it into a thrivefantasy.com account with promo code ethos. Get started today. The testimonials are really starting to pop up. People are winning big time money with our buddies over there at Thrive Fantasy. You should too. Again, it is thrivefantasy.com and the promo code is ethos. E-T-H-O-S. Brooklyn's in a bad way right now. Not Nick, Nick Claxton's not in a bad way right now. He had a bad ball game uh, the previous time out. Where the hell were they? Golden State? Not this one. Claxton picked on Sacramento to the tune of 23 points, 11 rebounds, a steal, and five block shots. It's why we said we were going to stick with him. Not because we knew this ball game was coming, but because, you know, Blake Griffin wasn't going to be the solution at center, and LaMarcus Aldridge is out at least a week as of two days ago. So Claxton's the guy. The last time we saw Aldridge out, Claxton was amazing. Why would that change this time around? That's why you don't base things on a one-game sample size when you know from a larger sample size, remember it was like two weeks or so, I think, earlier in the year, where Aldridge was just out-out, and Claxton was awesome. James Harden was terrible. He'll be better in the next one. Kyrie Irving, same story. They'll, They'll be okay. But things are a little bit of a mess right now for Brooklyn. They're a very shallow basketball team. They really have no depth at all. They have the same general issues that the Lakers have had. The difference has been that for a while, Kevin Durant basically just carried Brooklyn to wins uh, with James Harden, but it was mostly KD. Because now you're seeing Harden and Kyrie together. They're fine, but they're not 
They're not winning those games where they sort of toyed with their food. Remember, the the Nets played with their food so much earlier this year and then just kept winning close games at the end because they had Kevin Durant. It's a pretty sweet thing to have. Well, he's out right now. Brooklyn is spiraling. And you remember a couple days ago, I went on VEASAN. I was on Tuesday. I went on uh, a numbers game with my good buddy, Gil Alexander. And he was like, what about the Atlantic division? Should it be Philadelphia? And I said, yeah, they're probably going to win it. But what about Boston at 25 to 1 odds to win the division? Well, guess what? Since then, Boston won a game. Philly and Brooklyn each lost a game. Celtics are only three and a half, no, four games out of the division lead. And they were 25 to 1 a couple days ago with a much easier schedule. Philly's got a tough schedule. Brooklyn's got a tough schedule. Anything can happen. Probably won't happen, but anything could happen. Sacramento side, um, Rashawn Holmes, only 21 minutes, nine points, nine boards, and a block. He was fine. Admittedly, he was, he kind of got outplayed by Chimezi Metu and Damian Jones. So they saw a little bit of extra time. And that's the way things are going to go for the Kings right now. Outside of Tyrese Halliburton, it's going to be a bit of a mix and match. Who's hot, who's not, who's playing well, who's playing hard on a night-to-night basis. Alvin Gentry is just trying to save his brain at this point. And even Harrison Barnes, who actually had a really good game going, only played 29 minutes. Mo Harkless played 34. They liked what he was doing. Davian Mitchell played 35. And, you know, no valuation changes really on the Kings' side, other than to note Halliburton, obviously, with no De'Aaron Fox. He's locked into a massive role. Barnes is definitely startable these days. He's sort of warmed back up again after kind of a slow spell, and it may have something to do with Fox being out. Uh, I think you can still start Holmes most ball games. I, you know, even at 21 minutes, he's still a better than top 100 guy. Buddy Heald is a question mark. He's a close your eyes and pray it works out at the end of the month fantasy play. And then Davian Mitchell is your low-end streamer. It's the same thing I said last time. He's a very good defender who doesn't get that many defensive stats. Then translate, whatever reason. Anyway, move along. Denver, Utah, zombie game. No Nikola Jokic on top of everybody else that's out for the Nuggets. No Aaron Gordon also in that one, I should say, on top of everybody else that's out for the Nuggets. So pretty much throw this game out. Unless we find out the next game, everybody, the same dudes are going to be out again. Uh, You know, in in that instance, I would start Monte Morris pretty confidently. No Jokic, no Gordon. And Morris was okay. Barton was fine. You'd start him too. That's about as far as I'd go in these types of spots. And on the Utah side, Hassan Whiteside was out with a back issue on top of Rudy Gobert, on top of Donovan Mitchell, on top of Jordan Clarkson. Must be coming up on the All-Star break or something. Half the damn NBA is hurt right now. So Mike Conley is an easy start, of course. He gets a big bump. The guy I think that moves over the cut line is Royce O'Neal when all of those guys are out. But I don't think I can use a move on that because I think at least one of those dudes plays in the next ballgame. I don't know who it's going to be, but I think it's going to be one. Probably on both sides. Someone's going to play. I guess if they don't, at least we know. But if we don't know a day in advance, I, you know, even in Roto for like day ahead type of roster moves, if you can do something a day of in Roto with no moves limit, Royce O'Neal is the guy you pick up. And then Lakers in Portland, really nothing out of this ball game. Mello was good. He should be good while LeBron is out. Malik Monk was bad. He should be good while LeBron is out. I would stick with it. On the Portland side, it's basically the starters at this point. Nurk, Simons, McCollum, Covington, Powell. How about that weird-ass line from Rob Covington? 0 for 8 from the field. 13 point, or 13 rebounds, 9 assists for Rocco. 4 steals and a block. I will always have a soft spot in my heart for a guy who goes 0, 13, 9, 4, and 1. I mean, if he hits two three-pointers in that game, if he hits anything in that game, it's a fantastic fantasy line. As it's th- as it is now, it's a very odd one. But odd is okay. We'll take odd on a night-to-night basis. Dwight Howard did start the second half. I think probably just a bang with Yusuf Nurkic. Uh, Anthony Davis looked mad in this game. He was driving angry. Lakers played good defense, actually, against Portland. They were trying at that end of the floor, and having AD around does make a little bit of a difference in that regard. Uh, and this is one of those ones where Mello was so hot that his offense far outweighed his bad defense. And the other note is, when the Lakers play teams that aren't very good at pick-and-roll offense, they can hang in there right now. A good pick-and-roll orchestrator 
is basically the Lakers' kryptonite at this point. And the only reason to bring that up is when you talk about Melo. We talk about Carmelo Anthony and what he can do on a game-to-game basis. So if you really want to know, is is this going to be a big game for Melo? You can probably just look at who the other team has as their main guy. Is it an ISO player? Because the Lakers might be able to hang in there a little bit there. Is it Trey Young? You're cooked. It's going to be dunks on every damn possession. Lakers play the Clippers tonight. Uh, I'll admit I haven't watched a ton of Clippers basketball lately, but I don't think it's all pick and roll. I don't know that they have anyone on that team that is uh, particularly effective at it. Reggie Jackson may be the closest. The rest of those guys, they're, you know, smart. It's smart basketball from the Clippers. It's going to be... Might be a little ugly. <laughs> Might be a little ugly <laughs> tonight, for whatever that's worth. Uh, hey, new month! A couple days ago, I guess. New month, new time to go hang out with our buddies over at Manscaped.com. You guys did a nice job of kicking things back into high gear with getting some Manscaped items in January. And you know, I was just... I felt like last month I needed to kind of give it to you guys a little bit straighter. As opposed to just reading through the latest stuff that they got going on. And I'll do the same thing this month. I think the lawnmower 3.0, which is the last generation lawnmower, is my favorite sideburn trimmer of all time. De- uh, I'm debating whether or not... Yeah, you know what? Fine. Whatever. I'll tell you guys. Um, my wife used it on my neck. The back of my neck. It's gross. I know. Yesterday. Kids went to sleep. I said, I need you to help clean up my upper back and lower neck. And she did it. And it was the lawnmower 3.0. Not one pinch, not one scratch. I swear, and, and I know, shout out to Manscaped, because the 4.0 is super sleek and actually gets a tighter shave than the 3.0. But I love the 3.0 the most. I do. It's just where I'm at with it. You can get 20% off and free shipping with promo code ETHOS20, E-T-H-O-S-20, or... Hoopball 20 still works if you want to throw the old one back in there. Either way, 20% off and free shipping. I I promise you, if you get the 3.0, the Lawnmower 3.0, you'll be happy forever. It's the best sideburn trimmer I think ever created on planet Earth. I don't know that anybody's going to perfect it. Like, the, the lack of pinching, the charge, the light, the grip, the weight... It's just the perfect sideburn trimmer. So go get one. Let's keep our partnership with Manscaped cooking, too. And everybody ends up happy. Manscaped is happy because you got a thing. We're happy because then Manscaped sticks with us. And you're happy because you get the best damn sideburn trimmer of all time. You can check out their other products while you're there, too. Manscaped.com. Hover over the products tab. Check out all the cool stuff they got going on. Luxury nail kit. Probably my second favorite thing. And also, um, not at all expensive. The shears. It's the luxury nail kit. It's only 20 bucks before our coupon. You can take $4 off that and get free shipping. $16 nail kit. Clipper. Uh, tweezers. Nail file. Tiny scissors. Round point tiny scissors. I don't know. I guess you could use that on a really thick abrasive nail. The clipper, I think, is sufficient. I just needed a good fingernail clipper. And I got that. And it comes in a little pouch magnetized little fake leather magnetized pouch love it manscape.com ethos 20 go get some stuff there now um shorter show today so i guess we can do a little homework segment at the end i've been trying to do that on social media which of course again you can follow me on twitter at dan bespris i think we're at the point in the year where there probably aren't a ton of new listeners to the show but if any of you happens to be new or even new ish First of all, again, would love to see you guys on social, at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, forgot my own name for a second. Ethos Fantasy BK is the Twitter news feed you need to be following. That's our guys over at Sports Ethos, getting the news out as fast as possible. Trade Deadline Show, link is in the description of the podcast. And uh, what am I forgetting? I don't know. That's probably it. Homework. How does it work? What am I looking for on a particular card? We haven't done this in a while. So just a reminder, it's really important to go into a night of fantasy basketball with a plan. Minnesota at Detroit. What's our plan? 
for that game. Don't care much about the Minnesota side. D'Angelo Russell's status is kind of the only thing up in the air. Detroit side, there's a lot going on. Jeremy Grant is second game back. Kelly Olynyk his second game back. Do we start any of those guys? I think you can start Grant. He played most of his starters' minutes in his first game back. Olynyk only saw 17, 18 minutes. So that's a question mark. Is there going to be enough for him if Grant is around? If, if Grant gets traded and Olynyk steps into a bunch of those minutes, which makes him an interesting trade deadline stash candidate. That was not my intent, by the way. I When, when we picked up Olynyk, like at the end of December, my hope was he'd just come back and then he'd have three weeks before Grant came back to solidify his value. That didn't shake out the way we intended. Now he falls into trade deadline stash territory. Phoenix is in Atlanta. Do we have a plan for this game? Do we care? Not really. Not much going on there. What are you watching for in that game? Aniko Kongwu, is he beginning to work himself into a timeshare with Capella? It's possible. That's probably the only thing worth monitoring. Chicago, Toronto, the whether or not the Raptors will use their bench at all. I think the bench players combined for like 35 minutes in the last ballgame. It's an absurdly low number. They're going to crump on the basketball court, but right now they're not using the bench. So I don't know. You might have to bench Chris Boucher for a little bit. I don't think you can drop him, though, because someone's about to get hurt on that team, and you know who steps back into a top 70 spot. Miami, they got a bunch of guys that are game-time decisions, but it sounds like all of them are trying to play. Jimmy Butler, P.J. Tucker, those guys are all hoping to get out there. Kyle Lowry is actually uh, a a possible one in the mix right now. He's a game-time decision. I don't know how much that shakes things up. Not all that much. You weren't starting Gabe Vincent anyway. Spurs, no Jakob Pertl. I got a bunch of Drew Eubanks questions on Twitter, and I say nay to Drew Eubanks. He'll probably get the start, and he'll have a decent game about one out of every three times. Okay? It might be tonight. I doubt it, actually, against Miami. This would be a tough one for him. If Pertl misses a week... You probably get one good Eubanks game and two bad ones. Can you catch lightning in a bottle? Can you guess the right one? I cannot. When I pick up a guy, I'm hoping that I can close my eyes, not worry about it. He's not that type of player. And is Thad Young going to step into a role? Probably not either. We saw what happened when Pirtle rested a game over the weekend. Thad played a dozen minutes. He's a pickup only if he gets moved. Sacramento got a win yesterday. We talked about it already, but still... It's something. They're the 13 seed in the West. They've been horrible, man. Yikes. Kings, 19 and 34. What are they? What are the Kings? Are they buyers? Are they sellers? We have no idea. Thought they'd be sellers. Maybe it's just a rearrange the deck chairs kind of situation, which makes them still an interesting trade deadline team. Warriors, not that interesting of a team. Otto Porter, questionable. He's dealing with some back issues, which, of course, this is the fear with Otto. And I'm so sad because he was one of my favorite streams and maybe it was just too many minutes. Should have known. I should have known that if he actually played, you know, 25 plus minutes for a week, two weeks in a row, something terrible was going to happen. But for the Warriors, they had a day off. This is not part of a back-to-back. So everybody else, anybody that is healthy is going to play. And then Lakers Clippers, uh, no LeBron. Sounds like. I think he's doubtful at this point. I don't know if he's been officially ruled out yet, but I'd be very surprised if he played. This is technically a road game, but it's, you know, it's in L.A. Uh, And then the Clippers are just so annoying these days. Isaiah Hartenstein is a watch guy. He's a trade deadline stash guy. We talked about it with Jonas on Tuesday. If Serge Ibaka gets moved or shut down or whatever it happens to be, Hartenstein is your guy. You could get out in front of it now. Again, we're only a week away. As far as the rest of the Clippers go... You know, Amir Coffey is pretty a pretty safe top 100 range type of guy these days. He'll have a game or two where he rolls like a top 75 clip, and then he'll have a few games where he's top 140, and it'll level off to like right around useful. So that's probably one you could go with. I'm not starting Reggie Jackson. I think I would probably start Nick Batum if we get the he's good to go, especially against the Lakers. Lakers, like we've said, they have a lot of issues defending good passing Portland didn't pass well yesterday. Clippers, when they're rolling, they're a pretty good passing team, and they're going to shoot from the outside a lot. Although, again, it kind of remains to be seen what having Anthony Davis back 
for the Lakers actually means for their interior defense. It does look like he's trying a bit harder now than he did at the beginning of the year. Still, we're talking about the Clippers. Uh, I, I think they should be able to get some easy looks. And for Batum, that would be an open three-pointer. So I think I'd start Batum. I'd probably start Coffee. I don't know if I'd start Hartenstein. I don't know. We don't know what Zubat's status is. He was dealing with a calf thing his last time out and missed the game. Does Ibaka start again for the Clippers? I'd love it if they flipped that. If we heard Hardenstein was starting, he'd be all systems go for me. Coming off the bench, there's still... I have a little bit of reticence. You could probably start him. 20-plus minutes would get it done for him. He's just the kind of energy guy that's going to get eight offensive rebounds against the Lakers. Just a horrible box-out team. Lakers... Man, could they use a Lopez brother right now just to go put a body on someone? Nobody boxes out on that team. Then they go real small like that's going to somehow make it better. Sorry. Annoyed Laker fan over here. Although I guess they did win a ball game. Lakers side, I think you can go Malik Monk and Carmelo Anthony in addition to AD. And then, you know, Russ. <laughs> Russ. Uh, until LeBron comes back. When LeBron comes back, I think you just go with the three main guys at that point. And that's kind of how the homework thing works. I want you guys doing this. Many of you know we've done this segment in the past at the end of the show. Quick few minutes on the homework. For a while, we did it every night. I thought it was more important for you guys to know how I was looking at it and what I was looking for. I'm hoping you guys are doing that on your own at this point. Tomorrow, we'll wrap up the week. We can review ads, drops, streams, all that good stuff and get you set for trade deadline week. Again, if you're stashing, make the moves this week. If you're not... Save moves for things happening. A trade could go down any day now. It doesn't have to be on Thursday morning. We had quite a few. Three, three, four, I think, before the dead uh before deadline Thursday last year. Keep an eye out. Keep an eye out on uh, Ethos Fantasy BK. I'll also do my best to get you news as fast as it pops up on social media. And to that end, I will talk to you over there. I'm Dan Vespers for Fantasy NBA Today. Hey, rate and review the pod. I love you forever. All right, so long, everybody. At Walgreens, we know February is the season for L-O-V-E. It's also something sweet for your sweetheart season. Or my favorite, wait, that's today's season? Or the just found out my kid has a crush season. Good luck, Mom. This Valentine's Day, Walgreens makes it easy to quickly get last-minute gifts with pickup in as little as 30 minutes. Because if it's Cupid season, it's Walgreens season. Right now, premium chocolate bags and boxes are two for $8. Offer valid through 214 while supplies last. Restrictions apply. See Walgreens.com for details.